1983 constitutions. These were approved by the Sacred Congregation of Religious on March 25, 1983, General Congregation 13 in 1982 worked intensely in the composition of these constitutions and in the norms applications, referring to them, keeping in mind the petition made in Decree 23 of General Congregation 10 in 1965, our prior legislation, and the directives set out by Vatican II. These constitutions strongly emphasize the importance that education in service to the gospel has in our apostolic action as the concretization of the mission which the Institute has received from the Church through its foundresses. Reparation to the Heart of Jesus Constitution Number 2 Reparation to the Heart of Jesus Number 3 We live reparation to the Heart of Jesus by participating in the fullness of the Eucharistic mystery. Our mission, centered in the celebration of the Eucharist, has as characteristic expressions Black Circle Adoration of Christ Present in the Eucharist Black Circle Apostolic Activity of Education in Service of the Gospel Apostolic Action, Communion with Christ in His Life and Mission Number 6. Called by Christ to communion with Him in His Life and Mission, we strive to continue His work of salvation. Contemplating a world broken, by sin impels us to proclaim the liberation, brought about by the Gospel, and thus to work towards the realization of the new order in Christ. Our mission of reparation, the vital force of the Eucharist, and the Gospel message, we announce all urge us to work for justice in love, and to keep alive our foundress's preference for the poor. Regardless of the ministry we engage in or the social group with whom we work, we want to be one with suffering humanity in whom Christ continues to experience poverty, oppression and rejection. Number 7. The apostolic activity proper to our institute is education in service of the gospel. It includes promoting human development, announcing the gospel message and helping peoples to internalize their faith, both as individuals and as members of a community. We realize our task by means of Black Circle Education and Formation of Children and Youth Black Circle Welcoming Individuals or Groups for the Spiritual Exercises for Prayer Reflection and Other Programs Black Circle Parish Ministry Leadership of and Membership in Various Groups and Movements Pastoral Ministry with Families and Individuals and Other Activities as they arise in the Church in response to varying needs of times and places and which are in keeping with our mission community in and for mission. Number 64. As members of an apostolic institute, we are a community in and for mission. We accomplish it to the extent that we live as a loving community. The community as such has a role of evangelization to fulfill, namely, to offer the message announces already made flesh in its own life. Whatever her position, each sister must feel responsible for the apostolic activity entrusted to the community. Likewise, the community ought to value and make its own the work of each sister and lend her its support and collaboration. Applications of the Constitutions in 1983 Demands of our Apostolic Vocation Number 6. Our vocation to reparation demands that we combat sin in its causes and in its effects. This obliges us to contemplate the world with apostolic concern in order to discover the challenges it is making to us out of its deepest needs. Facing a world deformed by injustice and oppression, disunion, hatred and violence, ignorance and forgetfulness of God, our mission urges us to work for the promotion of justice in love, in solidarity with those who are deprived of their rights, work to re-establish that peace and reconciliation which Christ brought us and make them realities in our own communities. Proclaim with our life and apostolic action that in Jesus Christ, the revelation of God the Father, the deepest and ultimate meaning of human life can be found, as well as the drive to build a world that is more just and caring. Promotion of justice in love. Number 7. In order to incorporate into our apostolate the promotion of justice in love and our preference for the poor as a sign of the arrival of God's reign, we will help one another discover the different situations that need our interest, our help, and often our presence. These realities will be taken into account when reviewing our pastoral choices and the orientation of our works. 
We will endeavor to have our communities, which work in needy areas live there so as to be in solidarity with our brothers and sisters. We will carry out our work with those who lack the necessities of life in such a way that they will become aware of their own situation and, in the spirit of the gospel, may become agents of their self-development and of change in society. In whatever place we work we will feel ourselves at one with the poor and called to awaken the responsibility we all have to defend and promote the dignity of those who are made in God's image. Number 10. The interplay between the gospel and concrete life, both personal and social, demands constant adaptation and updating of the ways of expressing the gospel message. This obliges us to evaluate frequently the structures and methods of our apostolic action so that these will always respond to the needs of the church and of society. Number 11. Throughout salvation history, God always adapts himself to the language signs and mentality of humanity in its various stages in order to enter into relationship with us. Today, technology and the communications media exert an extraordinary influence positive and negative on mental structures, ways of communicating, and on modern life in its entirety. Our mission of evangelization forces us to recognize this reality so as to develop a critical awareness of it and to integrate it adequately into our apostolic activities. Planning our apostolate. Number 12. All our apostolic work must be planned in an integrated and orderly way. This demands keeping in mind the orientations of each local church, delineating and following pastoral objectives and suitable action plans according to different areas and levels, trying to have, as much as possible, coordination and continuity in our works. Number 13. Our apostolic work must progress according to a pastoral plan. This, in addition to reflecting the particular elements of our charism, always implies some concrete characteristics. To announce the gospel in the context of a community. To use the circumstances of our reality as a point of departure. To accompany the gradual process of faith. To work toward the committed insertion of each person into the church community, according to individual vocation. Fourteen, to facilitate the following of a pastoral plan in all the fields of our apostolate, it is necessary that we be clear and joyful signs of a community of believers and give testimony of union through teamwork among ourselves and with lay people. We try to create a climate and structures that will favor the development of the person according to gospel values. We try always to remain open to renovation and to the changes required by the signs of the times. 15. In our task of education in service of the gospel, catechesis has an important role to play, because by means of it we collaborate in the formation of the new person in Christ. From the beginning we try to help the person discover the calls that God makes to each of us at every moment of our lives in order to respond freely to them. We try to have these responses lead to a commitment of life within the church as a personal choice for service of God's reign. In the whole process of catechesis, it is fundamental to reveal the value of the Eucharist so that each person lives it, shares in it, and becomes a committed Christian. Educational Centers 16. The formation of children and young people in educational centers has great importance in the Institute. In order to have this work respond to the primary objective of our apostolic mission, we should endeavor that the education be directed toward the full development of the person in both individual and social dimensions, and be carried out within structures that promote this ideal. That it cast the light of faith on the world of education and culture. That we work to build an authentic school community based on a system of participation and dialogue. The religious community is called to be the living nucleus that transforms the school community into a community of faith that our centers be increasingly open to all social classes, that they achieve an atmosphere open to the actual situation of the world, that our centers promote an education that prepares persons to work for justice, service, and community according to the gospel. We should empower our students to deal with change and to be agents of their own destiny. To these ends, in our work of education, it is particularly useful to promote unity of goals by means of a statement of purpose, objectives, and concrete action plans. 17. 
Our concern for formation ought to extend beyond the school years. We will take an interest in all the human and religious involvements of our former students. We will encourage them to be actively committed to serve the common good through alumni associations and other groups penetrated with the spirit of the gospel, being leavened in their home and work environments, various pastoral ministries. 20. The Institute cares for the pastoral needs of young people and adults by means of membership in and leadership of various movements and groups. It is important to awaken in the laity a spirit of initiative and responsibility so that they will be empowered to carry these groups forward themselves with a growing sense of commitment. In all our apostolic work, we want to help in the development of a deeper relationship with Christ in the Eucharist. We will strive to do this especially with those groups that are explicitly Eucharistic and which have had such a strong tradition in the Institute. 22. Among the various apostolic works we can do with adults, family ministry holds an important place because an updated Christian formation of the family is a fundamental condition for the education of children and young people. 23. Person-to-person -person evangelization is a way of existentially approaching the heart of the individual and leaving there the imprint of a word that is born from one's personal faith experience. This pastoral dialogue permits us to encourage and accompany others on their journey toward God. General Congregation 8, 1949. In this General Congregation, Chapter 5, which dealt with a more permanent structure for Junorates, had special importance. It asks that besides continuing the religious formation of sisters who had recently left the novitiate, Junorates also provide a solid, methodical, well-planned intellectual formation. Decree 92. These directives would give very good results in our teaching ministry in the years to come. This general congregation particularly emphasizes the structure of our centers and the care that must be exercised in the instruction, both religious and academic, of students. Chapter 7 Schools 123 May the work of free schools be appreciated as especially recommended in the Institute. The general congregation desires that it be given greater impetus with the opening of new schools and the expansion and improvement of existing ones. 124. May we strive to form students in a piety that is as solid and enlightened as possible, keeping in mind that the needs of the present times demand it. May the other Christian virtues also be instilled in them. 125. The schools will have grade levels, with the possibility of establishing all of the levels of instruction that approximately correspond to school age, 4 to 18 years of age. In the final years, this teaching will be preferentially oriented toward initiation into the work skills required in the home and professionally. 127. Religious instruction will conform to the plan established by the ordinary in dioceses in which such a plan exists. Otherwise, it will conform in its fundamental characteristics to a plan which will be established for the Institute as a whole. 128. The general congregation desires that the plan for the rest of the curriculum conform to what is in force for schools run by the state. 129. At the helm of the school will be a mother, a professed of perpetual vase, who will have the title of prefect. Her office will be threefold, one to assume the leadership of the entire school, two to take special care for the moral and religious formation of the girls, and three to direct the teaching. 131. There will be in each school the number of teachers at the number of grades and size of the student body requires. The general congregation recommends that teachers hold the academic degrees required by the legislation of the respective countries. 133. The number of students in each grade who are under the care of a single teacher will not be greater than 40 in the fundamental subjects, unless the relevant legislation of respective nations deems otherwise. 134. When new houses are constructed, the part dedicated to schools should be given the spaciousness asked for by the constitutions in Part 1, Number 287. The building and facilities must combine good conditions that are both hygienic and pedagogical. Chapter 8. Academies. 
137. The objective that the constitutions propose in the foundation of academies is to provide Christian education to girls, drawing them to know and love God, and to teach them, simultaneously with liberal arts and sciences, good comportment. 138. The practice of all Christian virtues should be taught in our academies, our education being based on a solid and enlightened faith which should instill in them the habit of working for supernatural reasons. 142. In the intellectual formation of students, first priority should be given to religious education. 143. In each academy there will be a well-defined curriculum. That of religion will be composed of the following subjects, Old and New Testaments, Dogma, Morality, Sacraments, Liturgy, Apologetics, History of the Church, and Encyclicals of the Supreme Pontiffs. The duration of religion classes will be equal to that corresponding to other subjects. Its study should follow the Diocesan plan or in its absence, a pre-established plan. For other subjects, it will be helpful to adapt the curriculum to one of the official plans of education. 144. The general congregation desires that in every academy there be sufficient faculty certified with the degrees required by the laws of their respective countries. 147. The general congregation recommends that each teacher normally teach the same classes, due to the expertise gained in a subject by its continued teaching, and for the benefit of our students. One hundred and forty-eight. The instruction given in our academies will include one nursery school, two primary school, three middle grades and pre-university. One hundred and forty-nine. When determining tuition, it is important to keep in mind the cost of living in each country or region as well as the tuitions charged by comparable academies. General Congregation 11. Special 1969. This general congregation follows what was prescribed in the Matu Perpio Ecclesia Sancti, published by Paul V.I. on August 6, 1966, in which, in the third norm dealing with the application of the Vatican Roman II decree, Perfecti Caritetis, it is asked that each congregation convoke a special general chapter in order to promote adequate renewal. This general congregation was very rich and important in many aspects. In Decree 6, we are told that apostolate defines the congregation's way of life, just as worship of the Eucharistic mystery does. It goes on to indicate that IT is an essential part of our charism, by which our institute is included among those in the church called apostolic. The third chapter about the apostolate is worth examining closely. Here we have gathered only the part of the decrees that deals most directly with education. It is important to indicate that in this document the concept of the educative community is used for the first time, and guidelines are given for a greater democratization of our centers. I Apostolic Vocation Principles 103. The Institute, included among those denominated Apostolic CFPC 8, has certain characteristics common to all of these. A. It has received from Christ by means of the Church the public mission to practice its apostolic activity, cooperating in this way in the spread and realization of the Kingdom of God. b. It exercises this activity in the name of the Church. Apostolic action belongs to the very nature of our religious life, since the Church has entrusted to us the task of practicing charity in her name. 105. Each community is called on to give witness of the ecclesial community, to be a sacrament of salvation in the church, showing forth her action by the faith, hope and charity of which we ought to be the bearers in all our apostolic activities. The community as such has a mission of evangelization to fulfill, to offer the message of love, faith and hope brought to life. 107. Our apostolic activity must always be a service in love, acting in the same way as Christ, who loved us to total sacrifice, in order to lead us to the Father. The Apostle will reveal Christ only in the measure in which he communicates his message with the love made a reality in her own life with which Christ first loved us cf. 1 gn. 4.19 110. In each province, formation courses will be provided for the various communities, to allow the religious to reflect upon their apostolic mission more deeply, and to prepare them, according to the possibilities of each one, 
to use the most efficient methods in the development of this mission, becoming aware of their responsibility before God, the Church and the world. 111. Besides these formation courses, each community should reflect constantly on the requirements of our apostolate and periodically review its actions on this point. 112. We should stress the importance of fostering the apostolic educational vocation in the religious in the Institute, for the various aspects of our mission. All should know the grandeur, depth and relevance of this vocation, and should be given an adequate training, which is to continue throughout their lives. In this way we shall be able to offer a testimony of religious educators, radiating joy, peace and enthusiasm. Apostolic Activity Eucharistic Apostolate 120. It is necessary to revive the awareness in the Institute that each one ought to leave on others an imprint of love for the Eucharist in its triple dimension, giving them a. The profound sense of the celebration and participation in it. b. A desire for and practice of personal prayer before the Eucharist exposed on our author's adoration CFEM 5060. c. The liturgical training that the Concili documents ask for, to all those who approach us in our apostolic activities, especially in our educational and spiritual centers. This apostolate must not be reduced simply to structured forms. Apostolate with the Poor 124. The Institute is to continue to give priority to apostolate with the poor, dedicating the greater part of our apostolic activity to those in most need, those who in working class areas, slums, rural districts and underdeveloped countries, are crying out for promotion and are begging our help. This is demanded by the spirit of our mother foundresses, the clear insistence of our constitutions, the approbations of the Institute, its later legislation and the current directives of the Church. Apostolate of Education 126. In order to achieve the unity of objectives so necessary in the Institute's educational activity, a sure, profound and adequate educational orientation philosophy of education should be drawn up, in accordance with the principles traced out by the Church's teaching, especially in the Second Vatican Council. This orientation must be valid on a universal scale, for the whole congregation. Education in Faith 128. The importance of education in faith is to be made evident in our centers, and due place given to Holy Scripture and liturgy, the channels for an encounter with God. Insistence must be placed on the Eucharist as the fount and apex of the Christian life. As the center of intimate contact with Christ and dynamic source of dealings with our brothers apostolate. In this way our pupils will be given an integral formation as children of God and collaborators with Christ in the reconstruction of the world in which they live, and a personal encounter with Christ in the Church will be made possible in our centers. 129. Special emphasis is to be given to those characteristics of our vocation which are always valid, and can therefore contribute towards a deepening of our pupils' Christian life, such as, the full ecclesial meaning of devotion to the heart of Jesus, sign of love and salvation, invitation of faith to the alliance of love, association and participation in the redemptive work of Christ in daily Christian life, reparation as a response of faith and love, authentic devotion to Our Lady, the inseparable collaborator in her son's redemptive work, type of the woman fully realized, open to the word of God, and model of fidelity in her response of faith. 130. In order that the educators may carry out their task of education in faith, an effort must be made to capacitate and prepare all of them pastorally and catechetically, bearing in mind that besides special gifts, extremely careful preparation and a constant readiness to begin anew and to adapt, are required. 131. All the staff of the center, aware of their mission as educators in faith and of the value of personal and community witness, should foster the Holy Spirit's action in the pupils by their life and words, and should encourage the gradual development of their personal meeting with Christ in faith. Apostolic Educational Communities 132. In necessity and importance of establishing authentic apostolic educational communities in our houses is evident, these communities will enable the religious apostle to live her consecration in its fullness, will be a support and witness for a pedagogy of the faith, 
and will serve as a basis for the formation of the educational community in our centers. 133. In order that these educational communities may be a reality, and that our centers may function efficiently, all the religious must be trained for collaboration, for teamwork and for dialogue. The functions of each member of the community in the apostolic work must be clearly indicated, and they must have authority as well as responsibility in carrying them out. 134. The educational community, formed with a strong team spirit, is to aspire to the integration of a. A lay staff, helping them to discover the apostolic dimension of their task, the importance of their witness before the pupils, and the way of integrating the faith into the values of human culture which they present. It is also indispensable to give them a didactic and methodological orientation on the professional level. b. The parents, since education is a joint task of the family and the school. c. The pupils themselves, by a greater participation in the common good of the school. Since if we listen to their proposals seriously and serenely, we shall be able to insist that they keep their demands within reasonable limits, and so channel the rich patrimony of their energies usefully and constructively. 135. We must continue to adapt the structures of our centers so that they respond to the demands of the church and of the society in which our pupils are to play their part as Christians and orientate them to attain maximum apostolic efficiency. Democratization of Education 136. Our educational centers must be open to all social classes without any discrimination. In order to realize this, a study should be made in each country of ways to obtain economic help from the state, the diocese or other bodies, always safeguarding our apostolic character. 137. Where there is no possibility of obtaining the aid necessary to put this democratization into effect, the Institute will be generous in granting scholarships to pupils of modest family position, and will do everything possible not to add to the expense of our schools with extra charges which are not so necessary. One hundred and thirty-eight. Since some countries are extending compulsory education to include the first years of secondary schooling, arrangements should be made for the extension of our present primary schools to provide this teaching, so as to increase the number of intellectually gifted pupils who can pass on to higher education. In order that all capable pupils may have this opportunity, we should help to obtain scholarships for them. 139. The gratuitousness of the education should be adapted to the expectations and needs of times and places. 140. A study should be made in the countries concerned of the advisability of preparing graduates for oppositions, competitive postings, etc., since this is one possible means of obtaining aid. 141. In the Christian formation of our pupils and their families, the accentuation of a social sense will be kept in mind as a necessary preliminary step for a favorable reception of the democratization of our schools. 142. All those who approach us, of whatever social class they may be, should find in us the same welcome and interest, and especially in relation to the teachers and auxiliary staff in our schools, we must show that we are open and disinterested in everything referring to money. 143. From now on in all the documents of the Institute, all our educational activities will be included in general and without any distinction under the heading Apostolate of Education and Teaching Centers. In practice, the name used will be that usually employed in each country to indicate the different kinds of education given. General Congregation 7 1977 From General Congregation 9 onwards, the Institute was guided by the decrees approved in it ad experimentum, along with the numbers from the constitutions which were not affected by them. In this general congregation, the legislative decrees are contained in two parts. The decrees that the general congregation judged necessary in order to renew the Institute at that time in this section, there is a strong call to work with the most marginalized and the decrees having to do with the composition of the new constitutions. In the decrees corresponding to our centers of education, there was a deepening and development of the essential aspects that had been outlined in the previous general congregation. Mission of the Institute A 
Apostolic Work 13. The apostolic work of the Institute is essentially education and faith which leads men to encounter Christ, so that all may know and love Him. In this apostolic service the Institute, by express desire of its foundresses, must give preference to the weak and to the poor, in whom it recognizes in a special way the image of the poor and suffering Christ. 14. The Institute, faithful to its own charism, gazes on the world around it with a heart open and ready for present-day needs, wanting to respond to its call and to share with it the faith, hope and love received in contact with Christ in the Eucharist, and reaffirming the need for its apostolic work to be a serious endeavor in education and faith, which includes the promotion of justice and love and priority given to the poor and to the most needy places. Centers of Education 19. Within the apostolic mission of the Institute, dedication to the training of youth in our educational centers is of enduring importance. We must all become aware of the present urgency for Christian education for the Church and for society. The sisters dedicated to this difficult, but very important task should be encouraged to carry it on with renewed enthusiasm. Twenty. Following the lines of Decrees 126, 142 of General Congregation 9 our teaching centers must be, above all, the meeting point of a group of believers who in the educational and cultural world give witness to their faith, and their whole organization will aim at this. Hence, a. The primary aim of a center undertaking a teaching and education project based on gospel ideals will be education in faith, following the instructions of the Church's pastoral teaching and the characteristics of our vocation. In this pastoral work special attention must be given to fostering in our pupils a deep experience of the Eucharist, the source and summit of Christian life, in all its riches and dynamism. b. They will strive to build up a genuine educating community based upon a system of participation, collaboration and dialogue. The existence of a faith community, which gives witness by its life, proclaims the message and is united around the Eucharist, must be considered of first importance, knowing that catechesis is difficult and ineffective if the whole center is not inspired by deep and dedicated faith. c. The religious community is called to be the vital and transforming nucleus of the educating community, in community of faith. Hence the importance of constituting truly apostolic communities in our educational centers, made up of sisters with a real vocation for education and the qualities necessary for it. D. There is need for a team of educators which as a unit shows itself, in its motives, outlook and actions, to be a group of believers. The catechists especially must be persons enthusiastic about their mission, who prepare themselves diligently to fulfill it. E. In our centers an atmosphere open to the reality of the world should be created, which prepares for change and tries to discover in faith the passage of the Lord. An atmosphere, imbued with the spirit of liberty and charity, in which it will be possible to arise Christian responses, live by a deeply Christian scale of values, encourage a free personal act of faith, be open to apostolic dynamism, F. Efforts will be made to increase the availability of our centers for all levels of society, in accordance with the desires of the Church, to this end. There should be collaboration as far as possible in the process of expanding education, and equal opportunities, without any discrimination, should be offered for entry to the different levels of education in our centers. When it is not possible to obtain official grants, other means should be sought. Our systems of education must be studied to see if they are faithful to the aim of fostering true personal and social development which works towards Christianizing the world. The practical training of our pupils in the social doctrine of the Church must be intensified, so that it impels those we are educating towards an active commitment, founded on faith and sealed by the Eucharist, to build up a brotherly society based on the gospel values of love and justice. G. Methods considered specially suitable are Establishing a pastoral team or commission in centers which still do not have one Encouraging unity of objectives and of strategy in the whole education of the pupils by means of guidelines at the provincial level and educational projects at the local level Drawing up a manual of duties defining personal and collective tasks in accordance with the principle of subsidiarity General Congregation 14 1987
General Congregation 4T offers a response to the desire of the Institute to work in pastoral ministry with a strong sense of communion, overcoming individualism and achieving common approaches to pastoral activity rooted in our own identity as handmaids of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, which unites us with a characteristic seal upon our way of carrying out the apostolate. In the third part of the decrees, after analyzing the challenges of the moment, some general guidelines for pastoral ministry are given, guidelines that reflect the fundamental characteristics of our charism and which should therefore distinguish our evangelizing work. In the area of education, the specific guidelines proposed are the following.